<laughs> Did you think it was a spider? <laughs> a giant one. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to Gallery at the Station. I'm Lisa Merriweather Millard, one of the owners of the gallery along with uh, two other colleagues. And uh, right here is Barry Cooper, whom I'm assuming that you all know. Um, we're delighted to have Barry exhibited in the gallery today and uh, we're just going to do a little canter through his 50 years of being an artist. So welcome Barry. <laughs> well. <laughs> so, where I want to start, Barry, is, is kind of where you and your artistic career started. So this, this exhibition represents 50 yeah. years plus of being an artist. So, so where did we start on this artistic journey? Um, well, I suppose in a sense, um, I started with having a mother who um, went to the RA in the 30s, which would be quite unusual. Mm. In the 30s, she um, worked, um, her family were connected to St Austell Brewery in Cornwall, and she started painting pub signs for St Austell Brewery, um, which were um, the same size as my big paintings, they were six foot. Um, and she painted them with all the um, uh, proper techniques, beginning with a lead white base um, and then squaring her design off and then squaring up the, the big one and then basically filling in um, layer by layer. Yeah, so um, that was my background. Um, I was born in 45. And do you have memories of your, your mother painting when you were growing up? Yes, I, I have um, uh, an image of me um, playing with her paints and she's in front of the panda, which was uh, the, the Land Libet Inn. Mm. <laughs> and the, some of those signs are still visible in, in, yes. in Cornwall yeah, now? Yeah, uh, certainly the one that um, our family has seen on, on the Silly Isles was the only one where she painted both sides at the same, um, uh, uh, with a different image. But that's not the only place that people will have seen your mother's art, because they were also produced on stamps. Oh, they were, that is very, very mm. true. That was almost in her lifetime, but um, I think Kath says it wasn't quite in her lifetime that the, um, one of the more expensive that showed the barley sheep here, yeah, that's correct. So a, a, a start with art, seeing your mother paint. Yeah. But that's not where your career started, is it? So <laughs> no. you took a very different path, as, as, as many children often um, do. <laughs> I think I was probably put off in art um, um, until I went to university. And then uh, I studied philosophy and um, uh, I started doing these Picasso-esque drawings. As I, I grew up on the farm in Cornwall, behind the brewery. I was milking cows at six, <laughs> by hand. So a yeah. really interesting start. Mother, who was a painter, uh, working on the farm. You mm. went to agricultural uh, college. college did a degree in philosophy so so really kind of experimenting with a lot of different types of, of, of potential um potential careers i suppose yeah after working on farms for a year um uh, in lincolnshire and and in suffolk and then um um, I went to Shuttleworth Agricultural College where I was completely out of my <laughs> depth in a way because they were all farmers' sons who knew it all already and I... I had, and you, had... were the, you were the son of a mother who had been to the <laughs> RA in the 30s. <laughs> so moving, moving, I mean we're, we're in a gallery here with the most incredible art and it's, it's been a 50 career and, um, and, and what you see on the walls is, is just some of the work that we've pulled out of his um, out of his lockup, and it took us three hours to get to the end of it. So, so uh, you know, there's a, there's an extensive range of art. Um, 
what made you start painting? And mm. lots of your work is, is about movement. So can we, can we explore where that started? So I worked backstage in Theatre Gwyneth, which was a new theatre, a bit like the Merlin Theatre, but it had a fly gallery, which meant that even Welsh National Opera, they could turn up and perform there, and Rombert came. Um, and Chris Bruce, who lives in Froome, um, uh, he was um, the associate choreographer in that time. Um, in, and John Chesworth was the artistic director. And um, the whole company came. There were only 17 of them in all. I'd never really experienced contemporary music or contemporary performance. I'd, I hadn't. I think probably the only show I'd seen live was um, was the Romeo and Juliet musical in London. Um, that was about it. So seeing professional per performances put on um, uh, with with all the lights, um, everything dropping out of the fly gallery, it was amazing. So anyway, I did a lot of drawings. From the choreography, um, I couldn't draw at all in a conventional sense, so I expressed the choreography in a way which was um, basically like taking a photograph by blinking and then working off that photograph image uh, to come out with just fluid, and uh, you all know that a rotary pen, you can't move quickly. Mm. So um, I just produced these well, yeah, slightly Picasso-esque line drawings. And um, we can see some of those. Um, you, you, you have some images from early days in, in, in kind of Rambert and where you've, you've, you've taken a scene and, and tried to translate it in a way that makes sense to you. Where do we move to from there? Because you, you had graduated from agricultural college, you had uh, your philosophy degree, you were working oh. in the arts, you, <laughs> right. had, you had yeah. experienced some, some kind of contemporary music which had, which had okay. distilled some of that thinking of yours. Where, uh, where do we go now? Um, right, well, um, I eventually sent some of those. I, um, I, um, I followed them around the country after that, um, into the saddle as well. Um, and I just did loads of these drawings. And eventually I sent them to Chris Bruce and John Chesworth, and they offered me a show in the roundhouse in the, in the bar. Um, uh, when Chris Bruce put on, as you, um, uh, you'll see this video, the, um, uh, um, the Cruel Garden performance, which was the first, um, I think it was the first full full length ballet that that Rombert put on, yeah, and that was in in seventy five, I think. Is that what you were doing as a, as a as a full time job, or or what made you move further <laughs> into art? Um, well, um, I, I um, I've just been very lucky to be able to um, uh, you know to continue painting basically. Um, Kath and I got together in, in um, 71 and had children. She needed to apply for um, uh, a teaching job and um, Warminster was where we landed. So that's what brought me down here. Um, and then I had my second, just as we landed, I had my second London show in the um, um, in the October Gallery, which is it, just off Queen Square, where Faber and Faber is. So, um, and it was a kind of community that shows um, cultural artists from around the world. So, um, second London show um, that was followed quite quickly in '83 with a show. Um, with the square canvases you'll see, six foot square canvases, in the Littleton um, foyer of the National Theatre. Some people from the United Nations Environment Programme came and wanted to take it to Nairobi to be part of the 10th anniversary of the Stockholm Peace Conference. And um, against the wishes of the exhibition organiser because it was the central piece I let them take it and then I had <laughs> tremendous problems getting it back <laughs> <laughs> so 
And um, eventually it came back and Lord Bath bought, bought it. You ended up following in your mother's footsteps, didn't you? Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, clearly an artist. Yeah. Um, but, but you also ended up at, at, at the Royal College of Art. Oh, I see, yes. Well, what happened was the October Gallery offered me a second show. And um, uh, so I had a second show there in 83, I suppose. And the girl who followed me was um, Elizabeth... Lalicek, who now is, is still um, uh, organising in, in that gallery, actually. Um, uh, Elizabeth was gay and she, paid, she brought in these enormous canvases. They were gods on motorbikes. <laughs> <laughs> they were stunning. Um, and anyway, she, she um, uh, obviously, in some kind of way, thought that I had something um, different and so she recommended I went to the, she'd just been to, the, she'd just graduated from the Royal College of Art and so she suggested I went and see John Golding. Royal College of Art had taken him on as head tutor um, and um, he, he did his PhD thesis on, um, on the Cubists, well-known book on Marcel Duchamp. Um, and he, he put on um, several exhibitions of Picasso and Matisse in London and elsewhere. So I was lucky enough, um, he, uh, I went to see him and he said, yes, I think you should apply. Um, so I applied and I really enjoyed my interview. I took all the big canvases <laughs> and it was great fun. Um, and then I had a letter from the college saying, um, sorry, um, uh, we, can't, we can't take you on um, because we can't, um, I, I had to have it. Um, in those days, there's such a thing as an adult maintenance grant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, they said, we can't find you a grant. And then I had a letter from John saying, if you wait a year, we'll find, find the money. Um, so I waited a year and did an artist in residence in Froome College, um, which there's evidence of in here. Um, and then I went the following year and I had two years at the age of 40 being paid to paint. <laughs> and, but the other thing about it, which doesn't happen now with um, postgraduate degrees at all, it, there was no program. I was given um, uh, a space in the painting studios which were then behind the V&A um, and uh, on the top floor, you could look out on the V&A um, uh, garden, um, and so I had um, two years there. Um, uh, one year with John Golding and Peter de Francia, um, and then a second year with um, Paul Huxley, who who took over. Artists who were um, 17 years younger than me. Um, so I had the whole art school experience, um, which really threw me around. It was great, actually. And, and then all this feedback, obviously, um, really good tutors who would then send you off to see exhibitions or um, look at some particular artist's work. And so they just fed into what I did. There was no programme. And then there were group tutorials twice or three times a year and then the individual tutorials in your own space um, and then after two years they send the um, external ex um, assessor in who was H Hubert Linton I think um, who um, uh, assesses your degree show work and that's it. A huge bit of life experience, very varied, into art school at yeah. 40, which you had left the, the RCA. Um, and, and then we come across to, to where I know you from, with your, um, with your work at Broome College. So people who, who aren't familiar with Barry's work or who maybe hasn't, haven't seen his art before will certainly know of your work from ECOS um, at the Merlin Theatre. And uh, what made you do that, that, that wonderful outdoor Right, um, okay. 
Um, uh, what fired me up about the Cubist movement, because it was an amazing movement, was the fact that, you know, and the, you know, the whole inventive thing of... So, um, uh, I thought about doing, um, uh, uh, proposing a collaborative piece of sculpture on the um, on that bit of grass which Mike Walker um, called the Merlin's front garden in those days. It was just a sloping piece of grass, um, uh, high quality building um, uh, potential to it. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, I said to John Fisher, um, in 1980, he was the head teacher, he was the head, the principal of Froome College, uh, and he was, um, he worked as a team with Grant Bezik, who was the, um, uh, the head of governors, um, an ex-Spitfire pilot who lived in Causley. Um, and um, so, um, in 89, um, John, John Fisher could see that I was feeling maybe a bit of a fish out of water at the moment, and, and he said, well, make a proposal. So I made a proposal called Community, which um, I still got the maquette for it. It's in balsa wood, cubist figures, um, and it was a local parliament. It was, it was um, a local, and John Fisher suggested that I should have a seat at the top of this concept for anyone to sit in. Um, and uh, he talked about, you know, looking out to the wider world, and, um, but it was a local parliament. There was something interesting in, in what you had written in your biography, interested in teaching the stones to speak. Ah, right, well, there is an image here of that. that now this comes, yeah, it comes at the same time, once, what, um, once the amphitheatre was actually built, um, I was lucky enough in Shea Farm in Bruton, which had international workshops every year, to meet Joseph Mazundo, um, and one of his sculptures is on here. He was a Zimbabwe, Zimbabwean stone carver, um, really brilliant. Um, and so I kind of workshopped with him out in Shea Farm. I hadn't carved stone before. Um, and that is the philosophy of the Zimbabwean stone carvers. Um, Joseph had been um, a revolutionary in Mozambique. He'd lived in the jungle for two years, living off rhino meat. And, and then he came back to Zimbabwe and was funded or whatever to become a sculptor um, as a reward for, for that. And um, he was... Uh, and you, you'll see this image in here. He, uh, before I knew him, probably very early on, he did this. He, he had a technique which, which I got into a bit, but not in the same, where he would collage bits of stone together. And he collaged this image with this spear, and it's called the Last Warrior. And um, I can see some but, work with Helen Ottaway as well. Oh, you need to prompt me. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's, let's go back. Yeah, Helen Ottaway is absolutely essential in that because um, um, uh, she and I did this project round and round, which was performed in the... <laughs> I'm glad you're prompting me. <laughs> which, which was performed in the Salisbury Festival. And we came up... And, and you can see evidence of um, echoes of this everywhere, actually, with, those, with that blue and that yellow canvas. Um, so um, uh, I actually have CDs in here, I think. Um, she, um, uh, she composed um, uh, um, pieces of music um, going round the um, uh, one, one for each note of the um, chromatic scale um, and so I produced 12 images uh, none of which are in this gallery um, uh, which accompanied that Helen then made a CD uh, after the performance she made a CD with all those images in with, uh, and, and we have some copies here um, 
uh, and um, then yeah, so uh, it was yes. Yeah, so, so that was a real. You, you're right. It was a real collaboration um, between an artist and a um, and a composer um, performer as well. Yeah. Yeah. All of your stories um, are, are, are peppered with relationships and peppered with the, the, the space that you were, the thinking at the time. Um, and, and, and you speak very highly of the, the, the people that you've worked with. Before ECOS, I met Nigel Osborne, who was professor of music. Yeah, of course. Cool. Who was professor of music in Edinburgh. Um, and he was running a workshop in about uh, just shortly after the Royal College um, for um, um, for musicians, um, designers, um, musicians, designers, and um, choreographers. I suppose I can't. It, it was it, it, he brought it, his thing was bringing different disciplines together. Um, and um, I was on that course in Bristol um, and we actually had to make our own performance from that. Yes, of course, sorry to have missed all of that. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so uh, and uh, from that uh, I developed a relationship with Nigel um, that ended up with an installation, well no, firstly it ended up with a with a film for Channel 4 schools on the Ecos Amphitheatre with 72 from school children across the age range from different schools um, um, and, and uh, we turned them into tribes <laughs> um, for, for each stone, for the, you know, for each stone uh, um, of the original 12 nations on, on that and um, Yes, so we did that collaboration. Uh, um, I can't think what year that was. Um, and then 98, he and I did a collaboration in St. Mary's Old School in Edinburgh, um, which was an installation in the school, um, uh, collaborating also with Ricky DeMarco, who um, brought many, many um, famous European uh, performers to the Edinburgh Festival under his own right. Um, people like Cantor, um, uh, um, who I think was Polish, um, and uh, the other artist he bought, which changed my life, was Joseph Boyce, who, who, um, uh, yeah, he he. Um, had an international, he had a relationship with the Dalai Lama, um, uh, his work was highly conceptual and lateral, um, that, that really, really changed my life. Um, so in, yeah. the, in the spirit of kind of jumping through this, this, <laughs> this long life of yours and your, your 50 years in artist, um, we, we, had, we had the pleasure of, of listening to you play violin as well. <laughs> so, so we've had the experience of Barry um, listening to music and, and, and collaborating with artists and, and musicians and choreographers. And then you've become a musician yourself. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, you've been a, a, a stone carver. Um, what what does being in that creative space mean to you? Uh, well, it's the biggest struggle of my life. I'm probably um, un dyspraxic, un uncoordinated, and so um, uh, playing a musical instrument is incredibly even even to find the beat to actually feel the beat is. So um, uh, I've probably hidden all that because I, um, I haven't learned, I was 66 then and I'm, I'm 78 this year. Um, so um, uh, I think uh, it's helped me, it's helped me try and just, um, because you know, if I'm a visual artist, it's not a problem really. Even when I was working with John Law here, 
where, which we did in 2012, um, uh, doing actual performances, um, uh, improvised performances. Uh, that came easily to me because I could just mark make. But when you're playing a musical instrument, you've got all these things. Um, I can't read a score and play, so I have to learn the piece by reading the score and then um, uh, play from memory. It's the only way I can do it. Um, I would like to learn to be able to, to read from music, but, um, and, and then you've got all the coordination things of muscle memory. It's amazingly complicated. And, um, <laughs> Anyway, yeah. One of the most beautiful things that, that, I, that I find about Barry, having, having known him for so many years, and I, I was so thrilled to hear about um, you starting to play violin and, and adamant that it was going to be, going to be played in your, in your exhibition, is your, your passion for the arts, your passion for creativity, and it, it feels like it's your, um, it's certainly your life's purpose, but, but, it, but it is what has moved you through those those 78 years and, and, and given you a sense of understanding and purpose and created all of the relationships that you've had over your life. It feels integral when you speak about it. I'd like to interrupt here because Lisa here um, was instrumental in Last Tree Dreaming up at Froome College. I wasn't digging for that, Barry. <laughs> no, I, I, I can see you trying to miss out on it. Um, <laughs> So, so um, what happened there was that I found um, uh, Kath and I were walking through Longleat and Kath spotted this fallen oak tree in, um, in Stourhead um, and it looked in good condition but it, it had fallen in a storm in January 2013. Um, so I went to um, to Stourhead, and uh, and uh, it turns out that it, when it was 30 years old in 1798, it was paint in a painting by Turner, um, um, uh, view of the lake at Stourhead, um, and um, so uh, I went to Kim Portnell, who was the um, estate manager and he donated the tree to me for this project, which I was originally going to do in the silk mill, and then that didn't work out. Um, so I went to Froome College, and Lisa was made deputy head with a huge, huge program for, <laughs> and her job with, with, my, with my proposal was to come up with a proposal, which she did, um, and it went from there. We, we eventually got um, um, 44,000 from the Heritage Lottery, probably total funding of um, 70,000 with all the um, uh, um, uh, in-kind funding. And we managed to carve it with um, Lisa organizing, what, what was the group called you organized? They were an employability group. An employability, <laughs> basically, and, and, and they were amazing. They, they debarked it, um, and then um, I worked with Anthony Rogers, um, who was a proper um, <laughs> wood carver, where <laughs> I was yet again doing another dilettante <laughs> project where I had no knowledge. Um, and um, so Anthony carved um, A5 niches into the, um, into the tree, right round the tree, um, uh, and then uh, the students carved their dreams into it, Last Tree Dreaming it was called. And then uh, collaborating with uh, Azima Kafour uh, in um, uh, Young People Froom, who, who did all the fundraising for us. Um, uh, and um, with Grant Galatley, who um, built the Froom bypass, and then he went to the Middle East and finally retired in Froom. So, um, Grant has done all the engineering for that um, free of charge, and it involved all the calculations to actually re-erect that, 
Um, uh, and then with his own hands in August 2016, 50 tons of concrete under that tree. Um, <laughs> and um, he did all the reinforcing uh, as we went layer by layer up the, um, um, up the pit we'd, we'd, we'd dug. Um, and then um, he had to do all the calculations because there's three fins supporting that. He had to do all the calculations so that um, the tree would fit into those fins once it went up in the air and dropped in, and it it did it fitted perfectly. It was wonderful. You know, amazing um, uh, thing that. And um, then, as you probably not all know, um, in um, 2021. Um, um, Somerset County Council sent an arborist up to assess the safety of trees um, and he condemned this um, what was basically a timber building as, as being an unsafe tree <laughs> and then they and then without telling us they chopped it down into seven pieces. I'm in the process now and hopefully by the Froome College Open Day, we will have grant, grant has helped me with students have designed um, a sculpture uh, two metres high to go on top of the four metre plinth they've left for us, um, uh, which is called Sapling Dreaming, and it's a flame of re renewal, a kind of phoenix. Um, and uh, so students did the initial designs, made a full size maquette. Um, and um, it's basically um, a flame at, um, and that will um, uh, a fabricator in the quarry will um, make that into um, uh, a stainless steel sculpture to go on top of that called um, sapling dreaming um, and that should be in place if we if we get the uh, permissions and all the rest of it together by um, uh, by the seventeenth of July. That's the idea, anyway. And Pitt, sorry, that's a diversion. No, it is not a diversion at all. Uh, it's mm. a beautiful zigzag through your your um, mm. your fifty years. Fifty years an artist. Um, and the contribution that you've made to so many people's lives and the relationships that you've had whilst you've been trying to make sense of the world mm. and, and representing that all over the walls. We can see all of, um, you know, all of Barry's influence, not just here, but, but within the town. And I just want to, to end this interview as a, as a, um, a kind of a, a plea um, to keep the arts alive. Yeah. Everything that Barry has done, the way that he's made sense of the world, the way that he's beautified things, the way that he's used his experience and, and, and maintained those relationships over the years. It's, um, yeah, and, and even into your violin playing now, um, 50 years, it's a long time to be an artist. We are absolutely delighted to have his work here. And Barry is more than happy to walk you through some of the art now that you have the yeah. history and, uh, and, and where we've been over the last 50 years. Yeah, um, I think we should turn this into a discussion really and, and um, explore any, um, uh, if, if you're up for that, because I, I would say everyone in this room is in some form um, uh, an artist and and um, so it would be a good place to <laughs> to, to actually have a bit of a um, analysis of this yeah and are you happy to join Barry on a, a, a little walk through his art Barry, an Irish te technician who got me using the traditional painting techniques of um, beginning with a gesso ground and adding um, a little bit of linseed oil to make it flexible on a canvas. And, um, and, and you can see the way that Barry uses colour differently in, in different um, kind of eras 
in his, in his painting. Um, all, all these performance ones, that performance one with John Law in the Rook Lane Chapel is entirely um, um, acrylic. It's just acrylic. Um, and uh, I did three performances with John, um, two in Jack, Jack Dawes over three hours with a um, uh, half an hour performance. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to keep going. <laughs> you're, you're a performer. You can't stop. <laughs> now, lots of artists... Panic. <laughs> lots of artists tell me about an ugly stage. That, um, oh, right. That, 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 that they, they, they get to an ugly stage with, with, with art and have to really push, them, push themselves through it. Yeah. Do you have any experience of an ugly stage? Yes, I think so. There's two actually that I want to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, and pulled them out into the um, into the into the corridor of the lockup, and. Uh, and I, I can remember Ben and I getting really, really, really excited that these were going to come. And, um, and the one on the left, I just find absolutely incredible. And um, Clive Westmacott, who was working in the woodworking department, um, built me these canvases, um, which was funded by Bezix, actually. In, in, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the original face. Um, um, from um, the Magritte, yeah. Um, so that's that was just called, I don't know. Um, uh, I think we have it on here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, woman standing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and then and then birthright. So that, yes, these two were really important for me. I think. Yeah, they were. They were, and I love working big. Mm. Absolutely love it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Barry. Absolutely. And thank you to you. Here.